All right, welcome to another lecture in our uh, series. And um, it'll be Jerry presenting today, uh, the title being The Poetic Principle as a Force for Universal History. It will be an ambitious project in some ways because he's uh, intending on uncovering a, a huge span of history. However, um, it's extremely important today that um, we do have uh, an approach to understanding um, universal history, which is something that Friedrich Schiller um, uh, made, I think, prominent as a philosophical idea. Um, the idea that you could actually study huge spans of history going over centuries, including various cultures, um, but you could only understand this really through a poetic approach. And, um, you know, there, there's the, the joke that Gibbons, he, he's considered, you know, the authority of Roman history, but he, he, his uh, expansion of Roman history goes for thousands and thousands of pages. And uh, the joke is that William Shakespeare did it better and he did it in like something like 60 pages. And so really it comes at this idea of uh, what, what is an honest telling of history? Is it really the facts? Because we all know that facts can be manipulated, um, especially with who is in control of the narration of, of today. Um, and whether people realize it or not, um, you know, Oxford and Cambridge education, they definitely do understand that the comprehension of a distant history is what shapes today. Um, with all of the confusion going on, not only within uh, the United States as to what the future of that country will be, but also in terms of being able to facilitate communication between East and West um, in an agreement to a future that can be, uh, that can contain cooperation and uh, peaceful dialogue. These are things that people are not going to understand if they focus on just the now, increasingly the now. Although the present and the obviously the near future are extremely important, what's more important is a distant future. If we don't know how to organize ourselves for something that's stable enough to last for generations, um, we're, we're not really going to exit uh, the crisis point that we're in. And I think that um, a really good way to get people to think about uh, an approach to universal history is to read a few lines of uh, Friedrich Schiller, who um, he did a lecture in Jena on, on the subject. And um, I'll just read you a few lines of it and then I'll let, I'll let Jerry start. The field of history is fecund and vastly encompassing. In its sphere lies the entire moral world it accompanies us through all the conditions mankind has experienced, through all the shifting forms of opinion, through his folly and his wisdom, his deterioration and his ennoblement. History must give account of everything man has taken and given. There is none among you to whom history had nothing important to convey. However different the paths toward your future destinies, it somewhere binds them together. But one destiny you all share in the same way with one another, that which you brought with you into this world, to educate yourself as a human being. And history addresses itself to this human being. He goes on to explain the bread fed scholar, which I think is more than just someone who is a whose profession is to kind of defend a certain stance that they've set themselves up as, as an authority in. But we can say that it's what has created us to be stuck in a situation now where we can't see solutions outside of, of a box that we put ourselves in. So he goes on to say, who rants more against reformers than the gaggle of bread fed scholars? Who more holds up the progress of useful revolutions in the kingdom of knowledge than these very men? Every light radiated by a happy genius in whichever science it be makes their poverty, the bread fed scholars poverty apparent. Their foils are bitterness, insidiousness and desperation. 
for in the school system they defend, they do battle at the same time for their entire existence. On that score, there is no more irreconcilable enemy, no more jealous official, no more eager to denounce heresy than the bread-fed scholar. The less his knowledge rewards him on its own account, the more he devour, devours a claim thrown at him from the outside. He has but one standard for the work of the craftsman, as well as for the work of the mind, effort. And I'll finish with how entirely differently the philosophical mind comports itself. As meticulously as the bread-fed scholar distinguishes his science from all others, the latter strives to extend the reach of his own and to re-establish its bond with the others. Re-establish, I say, for only the abstracting mind, that is a poetic mind in some ways, has set these boundaries, sorry, not a, not a poetic mind has sundered these sciences from one another, where the bread-fed scholar severs, the philosophical mind unites. He early convinced himself that everything is intertwined in the field of understanding, as well as in the material world, and his zealous drive for harmony cannot be satisfied with fragments of the whole. All his efforts are directed towards the perfection of his knowledge, his noble impatience cannot rest until all of his conceptions have ordered themselves into an organic whole, until he stands at the center of his art, his science, and until from this position outward he surveys its expanse with a contented look. New discoveries in the sphere of his activities, which cast the bread-fed scholar down, delight the philosophical mind. Perhaps they fill a gap which had still disfigured the growing whole of his conceptions, or they set the stone still missing in the edifice of his ideas, which then completes it. Even should these new discoveries leave it in ruins, a new chain of thoughts, a new natural phenomenon, a newly discovered law in the material world overthrow the entire ed edifice of his science. No matter, he has always loved truth more than his system. He will gladly exchange the old, insufficient form for a new one, more beautiful. Indeed, if no blow from the outside shatters his edifice of ideas, he himself will be the first to tear it apart, discontented, to reestablish it more perfected. Who always new and more beautiful forms of thought, the philosophical mind strides forth to higher excellence, while the bread-fed scholar in eternal stagnation of mind guards over the barren monotony of his school conceptions. I think that, that we're in such a time where we need to tear down an old system of thinking that has, uh, I think, brought us to a dead end. And um, with that, I'll have... Uh, Jerry enlighten us on, on the universal history class. Okay, how's that? <laughs> Much better. Okay, I'm getting the hang of these uh, computers. One of these days I'll figure it out. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so uh, Cynthia asked me to do a presentation on the poetic principle. And I want to share a few things that I've learned with a few things that have been rattling around in my head. I'm trying to get out. But since I'm not that knowledgeable about poetry, and I know even less about philosophy, I'm going to discuss it from the standpoint of human history and of the occurrence of dark ages and rebirths, renaissance, they call them. So, this will be about the poetic principle as a force for universal history. Now, first of all, I want to point out that uh, mankind is much older and much smarter than the oligarchs give us credit for. Just as an example, a skeleton that was found in Afar, Ethiopia, and they called it Lucy, it's been dated to over 3 million years old. And this first slide you see is a picture of the area in Ethiopia where Lucy was found. Now, 
if we look at the last 3,000 years of recorded history, say since the fall of Troy to today, that's a mere one-tenth of one percent of human history since Lucy. So it's just a brief moment in the history of man that we're looking at. Now, most people are curious about where man originated from and about the early history of mankind. And some people excavate sites to find relics or to find evidence of human activity and try to date these finds in order to help push back the veil on the timeline of human history. Now, this next slide is Troy. On the left is an artist's uh, rendition of what it may have looked like 3,000 years ago. And on the right is what we find today. It's an archaeological site. One of our earliest archaeologists, Heinrich Schliemann, discovered the site of Homer's city of Troy in 1873. Actually, he found nine of them. Homer's Troy was number six. The sixth layer down was the actual one that you see here on the left. So this was a very, very old site. Now, Schliemann, interesting, in his youth, he had memorized Homer's Iliad because he loved it so much. And in fact, he could recite it from memory in ancient Greek, the whole book. So with this source in his mind, he went looking for and was able to discover the lost city of Troy, right where Homer said it was, which proved that Homer's epic was not a myth, which is what people said it was before Schliemann actually discovered it. Now, it was around this time of the Trojan War that the culture of the Mediterranean world went into a dark age. And we should look at, at the entire Mediterranean world as one interconnected culture because they were trading, traveling, communicating with each other, people in Southern Europe, with Northern Africa, the Middle East, Turkey, Greece, all of that. It was one interconnected uh, world at that time. Now, about 700 years after the fall of Troy, a group of poets and playwrights in Athens around a man named Aeschylus, that's the first picture there, began an attempt to uplift the population out of that dark age and into what became the Athenian Renaissance. Now, we can read Plato's dialogues about Socrates and his fight against the uh, quote unquote democratic party of his day that was dumbing down the population. And of Socrates attempt to stop the decline of Greek culture that Aeschylus had started to revive. Like in ancient Greek, we can follow the rise and fall of human civilizations in the rise and fall of their culture. Because the history of man is the history of a fight over ideas. Now, I first read this <clears throat> magazine in 1978, The Secrets Known Only to the Inner Elites. Now, while most of us are concerned with what's happening right now, uh, Lyndon LaRouche was talking about the long waves of history and how all of modern civilization is rooted in a fight between Plato and Aristotle. Now I'll read some quotes from that article. You can read yourself on the screen there. Through three millennia of recorded history to date, centered around the Mediterranean, the civilized world has been run by two bitterly opposed elites. The one associated with the faction of Socrates and Plato the other with the faction of Aristotle. During these thousands of years, both factions' inner elites maintained in some fashion an unbroken continuity of organization and knowledge through all of the political catastrophes which afflicted each of them in various times and locales. Now that's what LaRouche says, but today, 
in our schools, we are taught the myth that Greek thought culminated in that great thinker Aristotle, a student of Plato. Now, Aristotle did join Plato's academy, but he was sent in as a spy, and he got kicked out, and he left in a big hut. So I want to just look briefly at this battle between Plato and Aristotle. Um, without going into a long, lengthy discussion, I'm going to give you my two-minute version of Greek philosophy, short and sweet like the old woman's dance, as Abraham Lincoln would say. Now, St. Augustine uh, gives us a real simple picture of the essence of the philosophy of ancient Greece. In their discussions and arguments concerning being, or what is real or unreal, Augustine writes that there are four possible modes or forms of being. Okay, the first one is that which has a beginning and has an end. Now, we call this the finite or mortal. That's us, so we know all about this one, no problem. Now, the second is that which has no beginning and has no end. This one we call the infinite, or some people call it God. Now, it's actually hard for us to truly conceptualize the idea of the infinite, but as Nicholas of Cusa says, we can conceptualize it in a way by knowing what it isn't, and it gives us an approximate idea of the infinite. Now, the third mode is that which has no beginning, but has an end. Now, Augustine says this is impossible, since if something has no beginning, then it doesn't have any characteristic in it which could cause it to have an end. So he says this third mode doesn't exist. Forget it. Okay. Now, the fourth one is that which has a beginning but has no end. Now, some people call this the transfinite, and some people call it the soul. And it's in this fourth mode, this is where the fight is. Plato says that the idea has a physical existence, though it's not perceived by our senses, but exists nonetheless. Now, you can't see, hear, smell, or touch an idea it has no sensual perceptions, but it has a real physical existence. It can be measured, but in a different sense. And this was something that Aristotle claimed didn't exist. And this is the great debate in Greek philosophy. And I think in other cultures too. Because there has to be this connection between the finite and the infinite or else you just get trapped in this paradox of the one and the many, and you can't get out. Anyway, that was my uh, two-minute version of Greek philosophy. I hope you like that. Okay, now, Matt likes paintings. He'll like this one. So this is one of Raphael's famous frescoes at the Vatican that shows the philosophers of Athens. Now, I hope you can see my mouse here. I'll move it around. In the left foreground, that's this area here, um, these are the philosophers who lived before the time of Plato. There's Thales and Heraclitus and Pythagoras. So these are the ones before Plato. Now, in the right foreground over here are the philosophers who lived after Plato. There's Archimedes here bending down. There's Aristarchus here holding his uh, star uh, chart. And there's Eratosthenes holding the globe of the earth. You know, he, Eratosthenes did the famous experiment to measure the actual circumference of the earth. And he was pretty close. And then in the upper level here, all along here, 
Uh, this is a scene at the time of Socrates. This is Socrates here, and this is Plato, and this is Aristotle. So uh, there's a whole bunch more in this painting, but maybe someday we can look at it. All. But if you look in the center of the painting right here, you'll see uh, Plato is holding a book in his left hand, the Timaeus. And with his right hand here, he's pointing up, pointing upwards to the clouds, right, to ideas. Now, beside him is Aristotle here. Now, he's holding a book in his left hand, too. If it's close up, you could read it. It's the ethics. But with his right hand, he's like signaling to stop, you know, stay down, keep to your senses, don't go up there with ideas. And it, it's just... A beautiful way that Raphael displays this dis dispute of Plato versus Aristotle. Now, who really was Aristotle? Here's a little close-up of it. Now, I'm just going to go into a bit about it. The truth about Aristotle was that after Aristotle's death, his writings were, were bequeathed to one of his students and passed on to another student, and eventually were passed on to a man named Skepsis and his heirs. They were, quote, ordinary people. And they kept the books locked up and not even carefully stored. Later, these books were damaged by moisture and moss, and they were discovered by a man named Apelicon. And then the Roman general, Sulla, who invaded and captured Athens, he uh, basically stole and carried off a Pelican's library to Rome. And after a lot of work translating and editing and finding out what words were missing because of the moss, they were published in Latin by Andronicus in 60 BC. So I did the math, I did the calculation and in other words, no one had read Aristotle's works until 262 years after his death, until they were published in Latin in Rome. And then we were taught of the greatness of Aristotle, who was actually the philosopher of the Roman Empire. Now, in, the, uh, in Augustine's City of God, in books 6 to 10, where Augustine discusses heathen theology, and especially books 8, 9, and 10, where he discusses uh, natural theology and Platonism. He does a whole discussion on that. Aristotle is simply mentioned only in one small sentence. Aristotle is not even discussed at all. So for Augustine, it shows the unimportance of Aristotle. Now, subsequently, over 200 years later, we were taught of the different schools of philosophy when in 176 AD, the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, Aurelius established the four chairs of philosophy at Athens. The Epicureans, the followers of Epicurus, the Stoics, who were the followers of Zeno, of Scythium, the Peripatetics, which were the followers of Aristotle, that's what they were called, and the Academics. So those were the four schools that the Roman Emperor set up. Now, the Academics, however, were not followers of Plato, but they were the followers of the new Academy or more correctly called the skeptics, the followers of Piro. So we shall be forever indebted to Augustine, who in his dialogues, beginning with one called The Answer to the Skeptics, tells us of his reading of Cicero and his work to unravel the difference between the real academy of Plato and the so-called new academy of the skeptics, and thus of the fraud of the four different but equal schools of philosophy of the Roman Empire. 
So Augustine and Cicero had saved the real Plato, although we're taught the other crap today in school. Now, I just want to go back to this one. I'm going to try something, see if this works. Oh, yeah. Okay, laser pointer. Okay. <clears throat> now, in this painting, uh, Raphael uses a technique they used in the Renaissance called the vanishing point to give the painting a three-dimensional look instead of just a flat two-dimension, which you can really see the depth in this painting. Now, I'll just show you a little thing. Now, if you look at the top of these pillars, this line, get a ruler if you have a copy of this painting and just put it right along that edge and see where it points to. And do the same thing with this edge. And you can do this edge here. And you can do this edge over here. And on the floor, you can do this line and where it points to. And this one here on an angle. So if you connect all of these points, you get this. The vanishing point in the painting is uh, Plato's, the book in his left hand, the Timaeus, which is interesting. Can I, I hope everybody can see that. Now, let me just get rid of this point. Okay. okay. Hang on. Okay. So the vanishing point in this painting points to the book, the Timaeus. Now, before Raphael's time, the only uh, dialogue of Plato was the Timaeus. It had been partially translated into Latin by Chalcidius in the 5th century AD, and he only did the first half of the dialogue, the part that concerns the story of Atlantis. So maybe they thought Socrates was a historian and not a philosopher, but that's all they had for uh, a thousand years. So that's the important of the Timaeus, is it was the only dialogue and part of a dialogue of Plato that was available to people living in the Latin West until the early 15th century in Florence. Okay, now here's some people. Now, what happened in the 15th century in Florence? Now, this is a thousand years after the fall of the Roman Empire. The Christian church in Europe was in the middle of a great crisis. They had two or three rival popes, you know, heads of the church. Uh, Europe was threatened by the Ottoman Empire, which was coming from the east. The nations of Europe were warring among themselves with no possibility of a unified resistance. And Europe was still recovering from the earlier centuries Black Death, the bubonic plague that had wiped out nearly half of Europe's population. So around this time, a small group of artists in Florence, around a young painter named Masaccio, that was his nickname, began to develop a way to use art, painting, to uplift and save their culture. Now, this movement to lift the population out of the Roman Empire's dark age gave us what we call the Florentine Renaissance or the Italian Renaissance, but I prefer the Florentine Renaissance. Now, this time there was another group that included a young Nicholas of Cusa and they began to master classical Greek in an effort to study the early writings of the church, because the early writings were in Greek, um, to try to get help in their efforts to reconcile the Eastern and Western churches. Now, during the 1420s, a treasure trove, treasure trove of Greek manuscripts, including Plato, were brought from Constantinople by this group to Florence, and a translation project headed by Marsilio Ficino and financed by a banker, Cosimo de' Medici, was started. And by 1484, all of Plato's dialogues were published in Latin, but at 
over 1800 years after he wrote them, but finally they had Plato's dialogues. Now, at this time, too, this gentleman here, Gemistus Plathon, he was a teacher and a philosopher in Greece. He came with the Greek church's delegation to the Council of Florence. That was in 1439. And he gave a lecture on the difference between Plato and Aristotle, which no one had knew before. And he gave a lecture on the geography of the ancient Greeks. And this geography lecture was attended by a man named Toscanelli, who continued doing research on this, and he actually tried to figure out a map of the world. And it was Toscanelli who later provided his map of the world to Christopher Columbus. Now, as children, we were taught in school. I don't know about you, we were. This little rhyme. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Everyone had to memorize this. But it was to learn the importance of his voyage of discovery to the new world. A discovery that was financed not by the Spanish government, but actually the majority of the financing came from the Spanish branch of the Medici Bank. The same ones who financed the translations of Plato. Uh, and a little later, the head of the Spanish branch of the Medici Bank was a man named Amerigo Vespucci, who we named America after him, his first name. So there was a whole, you could say, conspiracy about discovering the new world. But Columbus was finally able to rediscover the old maritime trade routes that had existed before the Trojan War, before their collapse into a dark age, something that took over 3,000 years to rediscover. And I could do a whole other class on these ancient trade routes, but maybe some other day we'll look at that. So now we'll jump ahead another couple hundred years. I'm sure you all know Dr. Franklin. In the summer of 1759, Benjamin Franklin visited Scotland to thank the University of St. Andrews for awarding him an honorary Doctor of Law degree for his contributions in the field of electricity. And after that point, everybody called him Dr. Franklin. So while he was in Glasgow, Dr. Franklin made the acquaintance of a young musical instrument maker named James Watt. James Watt would later become partners with Dr. Frank, Dr. Franklin's friend in Birmingham, Matthew Bolton, to develop the steam engine. And you, you'll be able to read a lot more about this in Anton Chaikin's new book, Who We Are, that should be out very soon, I'm told. So, and Right next door to Watt's musical instrument repair shop was a bookshop. Wherever Franklin went, he always went to the local bookshop because that was his trade, so he liked to talk to him. So in Glasgow, the bookshop was run by the Fowlis brothers, Andrew and Robert. Now, I'm just giving a little aside here for Aaron because he did the class on uh, Jonathan Swift last week, which is interesting. Now, the Fowler's brothers were protégés of Francis Hutchison. He was a, a late professor of moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow. But earlier, he had been part of the circle of Jonathan Swift in Dublin. And while he was there, Hutchison wrote two important articles. One was Reflections Upon Laughter in 1725. That was his attack on Thomas Hobbes. And Remarks upon the fable of the bees the, a year later in 1726. This was his attack on Bernard Mandeville, whom uh, he and Swift both detested. Now, that same year, 1726, was when Jonathan Swift wrote Gulliver's Travel. And this was at the same time when a young Benjamin Franklin had made his first trip to London 
1724 to 1726. So I just throw that in to connect it to Aaron's class on Swift. I like that. Now, the reason I bring this up, the Fowlis brothers had worked with the university to publish the ancient classics in Latin and in Greek. However, they did publish one new English translation, a translation of Thucydides, his history, by Reverend William Smith in 1759. And they personally presented a copy of it to Dr. Franklin. Now, the only other English translation of Thucydides had been done by Thomas Hobbes, so it really needed to be replaced. So it's a good thing. Now, I don't know what Dr. Franklin and the Fowlis brothers talked about, but all I know is four years later in 1763, the Fowlis brothers would publish one other English translation of a Greek classic. The first available English translation of one of Plato's dialogues, The Republic, by Reverend Harry Spence which was now made available to a whole new generation of young intellectuals in America over 2,000 years after Plato wrote it. So they had it in the United States by 1763. Now, this fight over ideas from Athens to Florence to America of Plato versus Aristotle is still being fought out today. And today, but before the invention of computers and before the invention of paper, well, just another little aside here. Now, America's first paper-making machine was built by Thomas and Joshua Gilpin. Now, Joshua was the father of William Gilpin, who Matt has taught us all about and his attempt to build the Cosmopolitan Railroad to link Russia to Alaska. And this also is still being fought out today. So I just put that in for you, Matt. So before the invention of paper and of scripts and alphabet was the greatest invention of all, of language. Because before then, human culture was preserved through the memorization and oral recitation of sagas and epics and poetry. Now, today, people are always out exercising their bodies to stay in good physical shape, right? Well, that's okay. I got nothing against it. But we should also think about exercising our minds. And I think the best way to do that is through memorizing and reciting poetry. Now, I don't think we need to memorize the entire Iliad of Homer, like Schliemann did, but I want to just do some simple exercises for us in our search to understand the poetic principle. Now, here's a little one. <clears throat> I'm going to try my recitation. I'm not that good, but it'll be fun. <clears throat> the years at the spring and days at the morn. Mornings at seven, the hillsides do pearl. The lark's on the wing, the snail's on the thorn. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Okay, so that's, that's a nice fluffy little poem. It's very cheerful, right? Ah, it's great to be alive kind of thing. But its effect is very fleeting. There's something's missing. Now, it may help us forget that we're in a dark age, but it's not going to get us out of one. But it's okay. Now, Dr. Fred Wills, who taught me a lot about poetry, he always said that if someone wrote thousands of bad poems, but he wrote one good one, then we should remember him for it. Not like the mob to send to the poet in Julius Caesar. In uh, Shakespeare's play, uh, after the murder of Julius Caesar and after Mark Anthony's speech, you know, to rile up the masses for revenge. So the mob's running through the streets of Rome looking for someone to kill, to avenge Caesar's death. 
and they find this one guy and and they yell, kill him. He must be one of the conspirators. Kill him. He's one of the conspirators. And the poor guy says, don't kill me. I'm not a conspirator. I, I'm sin of the poet. The mob thought for a second, and then they said, kill him for his bad verses. Kill him for his bad verses. <laughs> now, in the middle of this tragedy, Shakespeare throws in this little comedy. I thought it was hilarious. So that's what Robert Browning, he should be, he's always remembered for this one little poem, none of the other thousands that he's wrote. But what's missing in this poem? Well, let's go back to the Greeks and see what they thought of all this. Now, the Greeks had names for three different types of love. While today, we only use one in English, right? Love, love, love. It's, we don't distinguish anymore. We've lost something in the language. Now, the Greeks called the lowest form of love eros. We kind of see it in our word erotic love, right? And eros means a love of self, a love of pleasure in our senses. You know, not necessarily bad, we should all love ourselves. We should have a certain amount of self-esteem and self-confidence. But we shouldn't be obsessed with this kind of love the way, you know, culture is today. So, okay, let's look at another example. See if we can get a little more. Now, this is a poem written by uh, Callimachus which was translated by William Johnson Corey. I don't know what William Corey ever did beside this, but he did a good translation and he's remembered for it. So let me get some water and I'll try this one. This was one of Fred Wills's favorite too. <clears throat> they told me, Heraclitus, they told me you were dead. They brought me bitter news to hear and bitter tears to shed. I wept as I remembered how often you and I had tired the sun with talking and sent him down the sky. And now that thou art lying, my dear old carrion guest, a handful of gray ashes long, long ago at rest, Still are thy pleasant voices, thy nightingales awake. For death he taketh all away, but these he cannot take. So this is a nicer poem. This is a better kind of love because it is about the love of someone else, you know, the love of a friend or, or a member of our family. And also it hints at the idea of the memory of someone after they've died. Now the Greeks called this type of love philios, as in filial love, like Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love, we call, that's philios. It's much better. It gets us thinking of life and death, but it's still missing something. To get us a renaissance, now, okay, the Greeks had a third kind of love. They called agape, which is a love of God, a love of beauty, a love of truth, and especially a love of mankind. It's a higher sense of love. So let's try one more example, see what we can get. Now, this is... Uh, the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to try to do this one. <clears throat> Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing 
whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Need some more water. Now that's a very powerful speech. And the world did not forget what he said there. It's one of his most remembered speeches, in fact. And this address, which is really, it's so poetic. It's an address to life and death, like Callimachus, but also to our reason to our purpose in life and death, to the intention that this nation might live, as Lincoln said. Now you could start a renaissance with that address. But where did this Lincoln fella get this kind of thinking? Where did he come from? I just want to read a few passage from a wonderful little book, Robert Burns, and the Ideas of the American Revolution by Mark Calmy. Yeah, a nice picture. There's a copy of the book there. <clears throat> okay, the first quote. At the age of 18, Abraham Lincoln came into possession of a book of Robert Burns's poetry. According to Noah Brooks, an Illinois newspaper man who was close to Lincoln, that book was, quote, a thick, chunky volume, as he afterwards described it, bound in leather and print in very small type. This book he kept long enough to commit to memory almost all its contents. And ever after, to the day of his death, some of the familiar lines of the Scottish poet were as ready on his lips as those, as those of Shakespeare, the only poet who was, in Lincoln's opinion, greater than Robert Burns. Okay, here's a second quote. However, it was not until he moved to New Salem in 1831 that Lincoln developed a deeper appreciation and love for Burns's work, as well as the plays of Shakespeare. This was due to his friendship with a Scots-American by the name of Jack Kelso, a sometime school teacher and merchant. Kelso was a free spirit who loved hunting and fishing more than work. 
unlike other residents of New Salem who fought when they had a dram too many, Jack Kelso would spout endless quotation from Burns's poetry and Shakespeare. There is no doubt that it was also Kelso to whom Lincoln is indebted for his reported mastery of the Scots dialect. Burns' hilarious and biting humor appealed to Lincoln's nature. Okay, one last quote <clears throat> from the book. This is attested to by Milton Hay, who worked as a clerk in Lincoln's law office in Springfield, Illinois, when he conveyed the following to a reporter. Lincoln could quote very nearly all of Burns's poems by memory. I have frequently heard him quote the whole of Tam O'Shanter, Holy Willie's Prayer, and a large portion of the Cotter Saturday Night from memory. He acquired the Scottish accent and could render Burns perfectly. I have been with him in that little office and heard him recite with the greatest of admiration and zest Burns' ballads and quaint things. That was one of the sources of his wisdom and wit. As years passed on, he did not quote Burns as much. He had then taken up Shakespeare and became greatly interested in him. And yet, I fancy that a great deal of Abraham Lincoln is bottomed on Robert Burns and William Shakespeare. Sometimes I think I can see traces of both men in his writing. So that was from Robert Burns and the ideas of the American Revolution. Now, Robert Burns was born on January 25th, 1759, that same year when Dr. Franklin visited Scotland. Now, Burns lived during the time of the American Revolution, and he supported their fight for independence. And he followed the news of the revolution very closely. He wrote a ballad on the American War. He wrote Ode for General Washington's Birthday. And he wrote Address of Beelzebub. Now, I just want to read the introduction to that poem. It's a long one. But I want to read it because it touches upon Canada, which is our direct connection to Robert Burns. So... This is the introduction. To the Right Honorable the Earl of Breadalbane, President of the Right Honorable the Highland Society, which met on the 23rd of May last at the Shakespeare Covent Garden, to concert ways and means to frustrate the designs of 500 Highlanders who, as the society were informed by Mr. Mackenzie of Applecross, were so audacious as to attempt an escape from their lawful lords and masters whose property they were by immigrating from the lands of Mr. Macdonald of Glengarry to the lands of Canada in search of that fantastic thing, liberty. So this poem is a letter written by Beelzebub, the devil to Breadalbane, where he thanks him for all the work he's doing and promising him a seat at his dinner table, you know, after he's died. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the background to this uh, poem. In 1786, one of the earliest groups of immigrants to Upper Canada, that's Ontario, came from the Scottish Highlands where after the timber was felled and the land was cleared, it was leased out for sheep farming. And many of the poor inhabitants were forced to attempt to leave because of increased rents and uh, subsequent evictions. This was called the Highland Clearances. I mention this because there were two kinds of people that were coming to Canada. One group were the Tories, who wished to escape from the United States and the American Revolution and their ideas of a republic. And the other group were like these first immigrants to Upper Canada. 
in search of that fantastic thing, liberty. Two different groups that are polar opposites in their way of thinking. And that's why I said this is uh, Canada's problem. It's not that we are bilingual, it's that we are bipolar. <laughs> now, at around this same time, Robert Burns also wrote another poem, one of his best loved poems, To a Louse, on seeing one on a lady's bonnet at church. Now, I just want to do the very last stanza of that poem. Oh, wish me luck with this one. <clears throat> I got to do my Scottish accent. Oh, what some power in the gift he gives us to see ourselves as others see us. It would for a money a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would lead us and in devotion. So I, I guess I better translate that from the Scottish. <laughs> okay. So roughly, oh, if God, some power, would give us the small gift, gifty, a little gift, the ability to see ourselves the way that others see us. Because that would save us from so many blunders, mistakes, and foolish notions. And our airs, you know, our pretensions about our appearance, and even the time we devote to all that, all that would leave us. So if you take that one line, to see ourselves as others see us, think of it like we're looking over our own shoulder to see what we're thinking and how we're thinking, to see our intention. You know, to be self-conscious of ourself, not self-love, but self-conscious. And this lets us be free of eros. Our airs in dress and gait, they leave us. So you can see why Lincoln loved to recite Burns, because there were no airs about honest Abe. He was exactly what you saw. Now, I want to go to... One more, another painting, Matt likes paintings. I do too. So this is a painting of Virgil contemplating the bust of Homer by Rembrandt. Now, some people say it's Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer. It's the same thing, but I prefer Virgil contemplating Homer. Because you see Virgil and he's dressed in very fine clothes and lots of jewelry. He seems to have airs and dress and gait, huh? And he's touching Homer's head. He's, he's grasping for something. So what is it that the blind Homer could see that the seeing Virgil could not? Now, Homer was trying to preserve the history and the tragedy of the Greek Civil War, perhaps for us to learn from. While Virgil was paid to write a fictional account of the founding of Rome, like a puff piece, puff piece to try to show that the Romans were somehow descended from the Trojans, in order to connect them to Homer's heroic epic. But Virgil can't figure out how Homer did it. Because, like Aristotle, he doesn't believe in the Platonic idea. And because he doesn't have a love of truth or beauty, he can't access the reasoning of agape. And he only has eros, you know, man's passions to guide him. And I think that's probably why Dante wouldn't let Virgil enter into paradise in the Divine Comedy. You know, it's like uh, he's saying, sorry, no arrows here, buddy. Only Agape is allowed in heaven. Sorry, you can't come in. <laughs> you know, Fred Wills used to say one thing all the time. When reason and passion conflict, let reason prevail. You know, he saw this 
fight between Eros and Agatha. So Virgil will search and search, but he's never going to find what he's searching for. He's kind of like the knight in Poe's El Dorado. You know, the very end of the poem. Shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow. Ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. Because if the knight is motivated by arrows, the search for the lost city of gold, right, the lust for gold, then he's never going to find real happiness. He's like Don Quixote, right? Just, just a fool, a waste of his life. So, like in Raphael's painting, will he be like Aristotle with his hand saying, you know, stay down, stay in the world of the senses? Or will he be like Plato in the painting, pointing upwards, remember? To soar into the clouds, into the realm of ideas, right? It kind of reminds me of a poem uh, Keats wrote called Fancy. This is just the first few little lines of it. Ever let the fancy roam. Pleasure never is at home. At a touch, sweet pleasure melted, like to bubbles when rain pelted. Then let winged fancy wander through the thought still spread beyond her. Open wide the mind's cage door, she'll dart forth. And cloudward soar, right? The soaring. Because if the knight is motivated by agape, by love of mankind, he might find something. Because <clears throat> when we hear or see someone else's idea, and that idea becomes a part of our way of thinking, then that idea and that person lives on in us. And even if we don't find exactly what we're seeking, we at least can leave something behind for others, something that may help them in their search. And I think that this idea, this is the poetic principle, as it can become a force for universal history. Someone gave it a beginning, but depending on us, it doesn't have to have an ending. But I think this presentation needs to have an ending. I'm getting tired. So I'm going to stop right here. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt for any comments or criticisms or complaints or any demands for a repo. audio back on. Okay, Matt, it's all yours. So I think Cynthia is the uh, the moderator here. So Cynthia, oh, what do you... Uh... No, feel free. Uh, I think this <laughs> is open discussion right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jerry, thank you very much for uh, for taking us through that thumbnail sketch of uh, such a little subject. <laughs> you really uh, <laughs> use your time very effectively. Okay, it was fun. I could Thanks be a lot. Great uh, lecture. Yeah, if, <laughs> if anybody has any uh, any questions or thoughts after uh, having gone through that experience, uh, now's the time to uh, throw your, your question at Jerry. Yeah, I got one, Jerry. Can you hear me, Jerry? Brian, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Okay, um, this kind this may kind of be kind of crass. Kind of, I was a great lecture. Thanks a lot. Um, it the uh, Raphael's mural is like one of my favorite uh, paintings. It has been ever since the, uh, you know, the uh, mystery, you know, the secret is known to the, only known to the inner elite. Uh, that right there captured me. But one thing that's always kind of intrigued me, and I actually looked up in Google or something, trying to find who some of those characters were in that picture. And the one that, uh, and you described some of them today, which is really helpful. But the one that always intrigued me was the guy that's kind of lounging on the on the 
steps slightly below aerosol. Do you know who that was in your research? Well, <clears throat> I did a lot of work on it, and a lot of people claim it's this person and that person, and I disagreed with everything everyone ever said about it. I did my own independent. But the guy I thought who's kind of lying on the steps there, I thought that was Euclid. Euclid? Yeah, because in yeah. a way, he's taking certain ideas from the Plato's Academy, but he's turning it into an Aristotle version of it. So also at the time, that's all that people had was Euclid. So you studied that. But I think the fact that he's not standing and he's sitting yeah. is a way they're trying to show that he's not really part of the uh, Plato's Academy. That's, yeah, okay. what, that's what I've interpreted it as. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I get your point. Thanks. Okay. I'd like to do a whole class on that whole painting because it's 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 such a fascinating painting, you know. It's so yeah. many ideas in there. They didn't have YouTube; they had Euclid. <laughs> okay, that's good. Hi, Jerry. This is uh, Dave. Nice class. Oh, Dave the poet. Okay, don't don't be. Uh, too hard on me. Oh, no, I was going to say, uh, yeah, no, I definitely like, uh, I remember hearing that you had done a class on Plato's, uh, I mean, on the uh, the School of Athens. And uh, yeah, hopefully you, uh, that, that would definitely be a great uh, essay as well. Uh, you know, for Rising Tides, just the counterpoint between all the different philosophical figures and they could be like a universal sort of dialogue in philosophy and using all these characters that's that that would be really cool as a as an article as well um and i liked i i i like the point you made or it's been something that i've been thinking about as well uh with even the lincoln speech that and, and what you said about lincoln uh and this book which i hadn't heard of uh lincoln's relationship with robert burns because today uh you know uh, as you said that one could see the influence of Shakespeare and Robert Burns in Lincoln's writings. And I feel like that's a really important point because in a sense, we all have ideas. And uh, I think, you know, a, a creative people will say, I've heard this before, like even Alma Deutscher, you know, this uh, musical prodigy saying that it's not hard to get ideas. Ideas are not actually hard to have. What's hard is actually the difficult part is rendering them into compositions, right? Actually holes and, and complete works. And so just this idea that Lincoln, the influence of Shakespeare, of Robert Burns, of how to communicate, he had to hone his abilities to communicate so that he could give a speech uh, about you know, the universal rights of man and the idea of mortality and immortality. And that today, because there's such a, a degeneration in language and lack of appreciation for the kind of metaphorical poetry that somebody like Lincoln would have been so uh, steeped in, you see that people, people go by their gut feelings, right? We see that there's still a response to truth and principle that you know, we see in, in the population in, in more of like a gut feeling reaction, but it, there's a, a more people have difficulty in actually fighting for these ideas and describing them, putting them into words. So, yeah, I think you, you, you made that point, at least it was clear to me. And uh, yeah, I just think it can't be uh, overstated that if people want to be able to defend ideas, they have to have the ability to actually communicate them, elaborate them in depth, you know, and really explore uh, the complexities of things. That's what language allows us to do. It's otherwise we just have these, these faint glimmers of insight and instinct, but uh, you know, they remain faint because we can't fully express them. 
Yeah, you can even see it with young people who text and they have their own different language they text with. It's different than the language we speak. And uh, also, I think the problem is, you know, when we watch TV or if you listen to, you know, so-called modern music on the radio, it's all about eros. It's all about human passion. There's no examples of agape in any of it. So we're really not taught how to see agape and understand it. I remember reading one time about Bernard Riemann, you know, the famous physicist. And when he was young, like at the school system they had at the time, you know, from the Humboldt brothers, they studied language and they studied art. And he actually didn't begin studying mathematics and physics until he went to university. They thought that was for later. Young minds needed to learn art and languages to develop <clears throat> their mind. And I think it would be good, you know, today you look at these kids, they're pushed mathematics, 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 because they want them to learn computers. But I really think a lot of them miss out on, you know, I, I was telling Matt before, like when I went to uh, high school, and we took English, each year we took a Shakespeare play. And we always took the one that was going to be performed down at Stratford, you know, the Shaw Festival. So every year after we read the Shakespeare play and performed a little bit and discussed it, then we would go down and actually watch professionals perform it. And it was just a marvelous education. I don't think they still do that nowadays, but at least I got you know, a half-assed education. I don't know what they're getting nowadays, but, you know, I, I agree with the point you're making about that, that it, we really have to get ideas are out there. We just have to be able to grab them. You know what they did uh, in my experience in high school? We, uh, we got to read uh, Macbeth and uh, Hamlet and um, Romeo and Juliet in grade 10 and 11. Uh, okay. As a reward for having finished reading each of the plays, we got to watch the Hollywood version of them with Leonardo DiCaprio or, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the end. yeah, just to undo any possible good we could have awoken in the course of reading the plays. <laughs> it just threw that on. Uh, yes. Well, there's a usefulness to that in a negative way. Uh, one time, uh, Fred Wills assigned me a uh, speech from... Uh, Henry V, you know, the we few, we happy few. It's a speech by Henry V, and I didn't know how to do it. So I went to the library and got a copy of a BBC production of Laurence Olivier doing it. And so I watched him do that speech, and then I went and did the exact opposite of everything he did, <laughs> and it turned out great. <laughs> So it's good to watch these Hollywood versions just to know what not to do. I really appreciate it too, because on top of having a need for um, an, a, an infrastructure of communicating ideas, which is lacking very much in our, our younger generation especially, but you also need to have a proper sense of motive of what is driving you, what is your yearning in, inside of yourself to define who you are as an identity. And if that's skewed, you could even have the greatest infrastructure to communicate ideas, but you will you will be misusing it, or or um, um, that 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 power of communicating could be used for ill, right? You could even be making people worse people by reading your creative compositions or, or experiencing your dramas or your film or whatever you're doing. Um, if you yourself are, are don't understand who you are, if your passions are are at odds with your own sense of what you think you understand you should be doing um and that's the great thing that you i like how you you went through that from the beginning by getting at these different pr approaches to philosophy um of defining being 
as one of these four paths, one of those four being an irrational self-absurdity. So it it was really one of three paths. And then zeroing in on this issue of the the transfinite, that things that the 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 category of beings of 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 ontological existences that have a beginning but don't necessarily have an end has been the domain where where um, this entire cultural battle shaping universal history has unfolded. I think it's great that you did that because that's really where we find the greatest artists um, uh, honing in on their power, right? Is that they, we're all aware that we're going to die. That's the nature of the human condition. Animals don't seem to have that self-consciousness that's defining their, their uh, day-to-day lives, where human beings can be aware of that. Um, and that could be a cause of existential despair, or it could be the cause that you could change your perspective and look at it from the, the standpoint that you just offered us and that Plato and, and Shakespeare and, and Lincoln tapped into to see that, no, this is a beautiful thing that we're going to die because we're part of this higher continuity. And there's something in greater and lesser degrees of intensity that we can contribute back into that, that wave, that, that continuity um, for the good, which is in alignment with our conscience and our, our hearts if we, if we choose to develop ourselves. So that's really, really important. I, I really appreciated that, that lesson, Jerry. Thank you very much for doing that. You mean my, my two minute version? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> well, I stole that from Augustine. That's where it's, I can't remember where I got it. One of his dialogues or maybe city of God, I can't remember. But when I read it, like, like you're saying, it just struck me as so simple but it makes that point, you know, something has a beginning, but it doesn't have to have an end. It's, you know, LaRouche used to call it a thought object. You look at an idea as a physical object and it really opens up a lot of ideas too. Mm. Yeah. yeah Riemann oh, John- talked about it too uh, with his thought mass, right? His Geistesmassen. Yes. Yes. They have, yeah, a, a permanence. Once they exist, they exist even, if, even though the body that, had to occupy space in time to generate that Geistesmassen. It had to, it, it, it will be finite and cease to exist, but that, that, that thing that they generated in the mind, Riemann has a whole metaphysics around it that ties into evolution as well, which is interesting. Yeah, and I think it's just good for us to, like I said, exercise your brain by just picking a poem, memorizing it. Hmm. It's funny. I was talking to someone, I forget, and they said, you know, you look back at the time we were in high school, and I can remember the words for every stupid song that was on the pop charts, every one. Well, I couldn't remember any poems. But even today, you know, 50 years later, I hear these stupid songs from 50 years ago, and I remember them. So, you know, we can, we have a great memory, and I think we really just have to aim it, you know, focus it in, in a certain direction. And it would be amazing the generation that you could produce that think of it instead of memorizing these stupid, stupid little pop songs, you were memorizing all these poems. You know, and you had a guy like Schliemann who memorized the entire of the entire Iliad which is all interesting story. That's also how he spoke about 20 different languages. And that's how he would learn a language. He, when he wanted to learn Russian, he'd go get a copy of the Russian translation of the Iliad. And he hired some guy to sit there and read it to him. And as he heard it, he'd learn the language. And really? when we learned Russian and did business with the Russians and made all his money so he could retire and go look for Troy. But yes. He had a, a fantastic memory, but that's how we learned language. Huh. Memorizing. His wife. Yeah, his wife. Oh, and his wife too. When he when he wanted to go on, he was retiring, and now he wanted to devote the rest of his life to go look for Troy. He didn't want to do it alone. He wanted to get married, so he advertised in the papers for a wife. And he said, you know, one of the requirements is you need to uh, know the Iliad by heart in Greek. And one lady came 
And she, I, I don't know if she knew the whole thing, but she actually could recite the Iliad in ancient Greek by memory. And so he married her. And the two of them went off looking for Troy. There you go, Madeline. I Thank mentioned you. your wife. Thank you. Uh, Madeline said I had to mention the wife too. <laughs> wow. When you said, when you were bringing up, um, yeah, per, per Newton said that's very romantic. <laughs> um, <laughs> When, uh, when you were bringing up Troy, you mentioned that there were like four other cities that this guy had to find before he got to Troy. Is that, did I understand that right? He yes. The, the Troy in the age of Homer, the Trojan War, that era, which I think the fall of Troy was 1183 BC. That, it turns out, was the sixth layer down. Now, there weren't any archaeologist back then, Schliemann was kind of inventing archaeology. So he's really made a mess as he was plowing through this hill and just kept going and going. And eventually, they actually found nine different layers. And the sixth layer down was the Troy that we know from Homer's Iliad. So that there's been lots of cities at that site for a long time. Yes. Nine oh. layers. <laughs> Crazy. Maybe we shouldn't fold in um, <clears throat> little poetry sessions into our uh, our Rising Tide Foundation meetings and do like a, a little side series of people where people have an opportunity to uh, recite the poem that they've been working on and talk about that. Oh, that'd be good. That's how Fred Wills used to do his classes. The week before, he would pick someone out and he would give them a poem to memorize and they had one week to memorize it. And that's how you started the class the next week. Really? Yeah. Get up, recite the poem, he'd talk about it, and then he'd go into his meeting. Yeah. That could he be just, really interesting. He was doing his classes and he discovered that America was a cultural desert, that no one knew anything. Say no something one. about say something about who this Fred Wills is, because not everybody yeah. knows uh, the name. Oh, well, Fred Wills was from Guyana. He was the former justice minister and former foreign minister of the government of Guyana. He became famous in 1978 because he gave a speech at the United Nations General Assembly, where he called for a debt moratorium for the entire third world nations, which really pissed off the British banks and the Wall Street banks. And But he was working very closely with LaRouche at that time about establishing a international development bank, similar to what you know China is doing today with the BRIC and road initiative. So Fred did that and well, to make a long story short, he ended up living in the United States. He was a professor at Rutgers University and that's where um, he became more involved with uh, the LaRouche organization and he would do the meetings once a week, our little chapter meetings. And um, the interesting thing was someone had to, Fred didn't drive, so someone had to drive down to where he lived in uh, Newark, pick him up and bring him up to the meeting and then drive him home after. And that was me. So I got, I was alone with him in the car for an hour driving him to the meeting and alone with him for an hour driving home. So I got to pick his brain <laughs> constantly. But uh, Fred, used to say, as a young man, you know, the British bureaucrats would come there and they would look for smart kids, right? Sharp kids. And they would go and say, look, we'll give your kid a free education. He can come to London and go to uh, Oxford. Oxford, you know. Now, what the British wanted was to bring these people come to London, give them a good education, and then send them back to their country so they could 
administer the country for the British Empire. So Fred got a scholarship to Oxford, but Fred, being smart as he was, uh, learned everything they taught him, and then went back to Guyana and helped lead the uh, overthrow of the British Empire, where Guyana became independent. So he kind of sabotaged them, but he said he got an excellent education there. And that when you go to Oxford to study, you know, you think you're going to study uh, how to run governments and all this stuff. He says, what they teach you is Shakespeare. You want to learn how to run government, you learn Shakespeare. And that's what he studied and turned himself into an expert on Shakespeare. Because that's what the British <clears throat> use as ideas. I mean, they're, they're evil, but they're not stupid. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that, that's how Fred became an expert on Shakespeare, and people love hearing his classes on Shakespeare. Hmm. And uh, that's where, and then, <clears throat> so then he realized no one knew anything about poetry. So he said, okay, then we're going to learn the shape sonnets of Shakespeare. So he went through all the sonnets of Shakespeare, and then he did the sonnets of Milton, then he did the sonnets of Keats. And then he would have sonnet writing contests for us to write sonnets. Most of them ended up in the garbage can, but you know, you, you got to try, you have to learn. But whatever little bit that I know about poetry, which now everyone knows the entirety of what I know, I learned from the little bit that I learned from Fred Wills. He was an absolute genius on this. But, so for those who don't know who Dr. Frederick Wills is, uh, that's who he was. Very good friend of mine. Pascal was kind enough to also uh, um, share with us a few of the nearly extinct, super rare cassette recordings, audio recordings. <laughs> and you also gave us one too on, on Fred Wills' classes on Julius Caesar from the 1980s. Uh, Pascal gave us about nine more, and we just have to figure out how to tra uh, transfer them onto uh, onto CD, and then we can turn them into videos for the YouTube channel and, and make them available for everyone else to to tap into. Um, oh, that would be fantastic! Oh, people would be dying to hear this. Yeah. I think uh, <clears throat> next work, week, Pascal. what you just said about Fred and his insight into uh, the British technique of organizing their uh, upper level managers for maintaining the empire. Um, mm -hmm. It plays right into what we will be introduced to next week as well. I don't want to stop the discussion if, if people want to throw more thoughts at Jerry, but uh, next week, Martin Seif, um, who's a fellow journalist with Cynthia and myself at uh, Strategic Culture, um, he's a, a renowned veteran um, of, of journalism now for decades and decades. Uh, he's written many books. Uh, he's worked everywhere. He's also in the world. studied at uh, Oxford, Shakespeare at he's Oxford. <laughs> yeah. There we go. He's, there we go. That's how yeah. we learn. And that, that, that has fed, in, fed into his um, composition for his class next week, which will deal with Shakespeare. And he's going <laughs> to go a little bit more in depth into um, the, the, Moral and immoral uses of Shakespeare in education systems, uh, using his drawing from his own personal experience in Oxford. And uh, I mean, he's hobnobbed. He's both studied under some of the most interesting characters and has mm -hmm. uh, been classmates with many as well. So I'm sure that'll be very insightful. And I think you've planted a good foundation for us to, to listen uh, to what he has to say. He's also going to go into the good stuff too. I, I mean, in terms of you know, he loves Lincoln. Uh, so we won't just le learn about the evil uses of Shakespeare. <laughs> I had uh, a reflection, uh, Jerry, based on what you were saying uh, and what Matt has added as well. Because um, I was, I've actually, I've been working on a series uh, based on this lecture series that I recommend to everybody. Uh, I would recommend to everybody. Uh, it's Algis Huxley's uh, what a piece of work man is. It's on YouTube. It's like a seven part series. And it's really 
uh, a great exhibition of how, you know, an evil mind like Algis Huxley really was intelligent, really was creative, uh, had imagination, but it's what he used it for. And what's so interesting is that I mean, I think to really understand evil and to understand what we're talking about here with Oxford and like, isn't that funny that they're learning Shakespeare, they're not learning how to run governments and all that, is that the real evil types understand that if you're really to control something like creativity, which is at the source of really what it is to be human and what drives society, what drives change in society and evolution, you can't really control that if you don't understand that. And so the evil ones really do go out of their way to sort of understand creativity, to know what it is, its characteristics, and are looking for ways to, so that they can ultimately destroy it and control it and create a system that doesn't allow creativity to flourish all other than for their own uses. And I mean, I think that's such a, if we think about all these conspiracies and the way people tend to describe the imperial system, what if we looked at it, if, if we were looking at really this oligarchical mindset as this question of understanding creativity, if we want to understand the oligarchy, we should study creativity because creativity is really the thing that the oligarchy is intent on destroying. Because if there is creativity, you can't really control the system. You can't keep it static. You can't, you can't have control over it. There's always going to be change. So yeah, understanding empire and evil is really understanding creativity is the key. And I think that's so counterintuitive to how people are used to describing uh, the problems of imperialism as, you know, money and bankers and gold and all these things, it's like, well, no, if you really want to get what all this comes down to, it's, it's, it's to limit creativity. And so how do you create a culture that allows creativity to flourish? That's, that's really all it comes down to. And so I, I think based on what people are saying, uh, a series on Shakespeare sounds quite warranted. Uh, one month where different people take up different Shakespeare plays, maybe a play at a time or something, or at least maybe that's a good uh, essay series for Rising Tides. Different people can choose their favorite plays and same way we do with poems or that we could do with choosing a poem. You yeah. know, there can also be choosing plays and reviving that whole uh, spirit of, the good guys have to study Shakespeare too. We can make that a new movement, you know? What do you think, Cynthia? Uh, I think we need to discuss it more as to how exactly that's, that's going to, it's like more of a reading group. I think that would work out. Um, cause we do have the, the science symposium coming up in January, mm -hmm. but I think, um, just the, uh, challenge of, of someone reciting something before a class for a symposium series, no matter what the subject is is a good start yeah um to study a shakespeare play is a lot of work because shakespeare's quite a master so that that would be a, a lot a lot of work to do in my opinion but we might start something I, we, just the format wanna, i'm not quite sure do we want to throw out a challenge now for somebody to uh well i think because it was your idea week? you should you should do it for next week i mean i think it's only fair and then I'm doing the presentation after Martin, so then I can't I can't be the one to follow after you. <laughs> Didn't realize this was going to turn back at me. Does anybody want to, other than me, uh, recite a, a poem next uh, week before Martin sees class, or or am I going to be? Did I just I walk into mind. something? I, I can do you don't that. mind? I don't mind. No. All right, Dave. Thank you. You saved me. Can I recite something in Urdu? How about the, the following week? We'll book you for the Urdu uh, recitation. Next week, Dave, you could do a, a sonnet uh, before uh, Martin. Eh? And yeah, I want sure. to do one uh, right now in German, okay? If you want. Right now? <laughs> yes. All right. Go for it. 
But you got to say what it is, though, right? Eh? Like, you can't just leave us hanging. Hall. It won't be the hall, okay? One is by... Um, um, Song of the Bell. Goethe, uh, Goethe, okay, Wolfgang Goethe. And uh, that Zauberlehrling, or that, yeah, that Zauberlehrling. Um, okay. Hat der alte Hexenmeister sich doch einmal fortbegeben, und nun sollen seine Werke auch nach meinem Willen leben. Wort und Werke. Okay, <lacht> habe ich es vergessen. Aber ähm, ja, und der andere ist äh, Friedrich Schiller, äh, die Glocke. Festgemauert in der Erde steht die Form auf Lehm gebrannt. Heute soll die Glocke werden. Frisch Gesellen sei zur Hand. Voilà. Just a little bit, okay? <laughs> I don't... What was the uh, the gist of It was the magician's uh, curse uh, by Goethe, and then it was the song of the bell by Schiller, the opening, the, the bell being forged, you know, and to... He calls the, the people who are going to do the work. Hmm. Oh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. That's from... Uh, it's also in Fantasia, you know, when the brooms are dancing and everything. Yeah, he called. He, he thinks talking. the master is gone, and now he can do the same thing than the master. So he is uh, saying, "Auf zwei Beinen stehe, oben sein Kopf, geht nun und geh mit dem Wassertopf." So he says, "Go and get the water," and so they're coming back, and uh, so the room is filling more and more with water, and then he wants to stop it, and he don't know how to how to finish it. And then last minute comes the, the, the Zauberer, the master uh, in, and he asks him to, to stop the boom and to bring the water in anyways. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, getting the ball rolling on that, Brigitte. All right, That's so not, next I week we got- I more, but I didn't want to. <laughs> no, no, it's cool, it's cool. It was off the cuff, it was nice. Uh, all right, so next week, Dave will uh, think of something to contribute as an, as an opener um, for Martin Seif. And uh, then we'll have a sad, and we'll, we'll go from there. It's a fun little uh, twist to our, our weekly meetings. Doug, I'm expecting you to, to think of something. I'm sure you have a, a wealth of poetic <laughs> inspiration below uh, the surface. You must be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you could do something from the Torah. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. All right. That, that, I'll throw it out there. <laughs> uh, just, just blindside me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. So I guess that's a good spot. Do we, uh, any last thoughts uh, or do we wrap it up now? I think it's a Thank deer. You, <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Jerry. Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Great class. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Ciao, everybody. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.